Good morning, guys. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Great to see you all this morning. Thank you. <laughs> oh, I'm glad Diana's happy. <laughs> So we live in a world with some issues. Yes. Mm -hmm. Am I right? Yeah. Uh, anyone have issues in their life? Yeah. Anyone think we got issues in our city? Yeah. In our country? Yeah. In our world? Yeah. And, and a lot of people, they love to point the finger, right? They love to say, it's not me, it's, it's them, yeah. it's him, it's my job, it's my family, it's my this and my that. And I think a real popular scapegoat that people like to point the finger at is Christianity. Yeah? The problem is just religion, it's just the church, it's just Christianity. And if only we could just get rid of all the Christians, all the churches, everything, then life would be great. Right? Has anyone ever heard that? Anyone ever, any, anyone ever tried to peddle that to you? And the thing is, is that people say like, that the church is so bad, it's done so much damage to the world, it's, it's harmful, and the, the Christianity suppresses, suppresses women and minorities, and it's toxic. And the thing is, is that they're, they're kind of right, that uh, the, when it comes to the church, yeah, the church has done a lot of bad things throughout history. When it comes to people inside the church, yeah, they're right, the people inside the church have done a lot of bad things. But it'd be like saying, hey, we need to get rid of all knives because knives kill people. Yeah. It's like, well, no, if you use a knife to cut people, that's bad. Exactly. If you use it to cut fruit, then that's, that's okay, right? Yeah. Anyone here like fruit salad? Yeah. Yes. Slice up maybe a pineapple or mango or things oh, like yeah. that? Yeah. Try cutting up a mango with a spoon. Have fun with that, guys. <laughs> so this is the thing, is that people have issues and they point the finger at God and they point the finger at the Bible when actually they have a problem with is sin. Yeah. The problem in the world is sin. It always has been that way and it always will be that way. Right. And this is nothing new. People talk about how bad life is and how bad society is. Uh, but the truth is, is that like, life has never been better. We, we talk about all the problems, war, sickness, hardships. Um, and, and the truth is, like, this is the best it's, it's ever been in history. If you really look back throughout history, Jen's nodding her head because she's a historian of history, uh, she's a doctorate of history. Um, and and, and this, this week, uh, we, they, we celebrated a hundred years since women got the vote here in the UK. And it's, it's been amazing. And, and the, what it is is that people are pushing all that. We need so much more for, for women, 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 women's empowerment, women this, women that. And we love women, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I love women, especially this one right here. She's great. And, and the thing is, is that people talk about how bad society is for women today. But the truth is, is that women have never been more educated, they've never been more empowered, and they've never been more equal than they are today in society. And what, it, it just drives me crazy when people say, like, yeah, the, the secret is getting rid of Christianity. And once we can get rid of the negative impact of the Bible, then that will really help elevate women. And the truth is that people just don't know their history. They, when I, I go on LSC uh, to talk to people and they talk about Greek philosophy. Or they talk about, yeah, the, the Greeks, they did this and they did that. Let me tell you about Greek philosophy. Let me tell you what the Greeks said about women. Sophocles said, a woman, woman's best jewel is silence. For as leaves decorate trees, wool is the beauty of sheep, the mane the glory of horses, and the beard the pride of a man. So silence is the jewel of women. Democrates said, a woman must not practice argument. This is dreadful. To be ruled by a woman is the ultimate outrage for a man. So this is how Greek philosophy sees women. And this is the world 2,000 years ago in the Greco-Roman Empire. Where we get many of our modern ideology from actually comes from Greek philosophy. Even the word democracy is a Greek idea. So the, the society that we're in, the, the injustice, the oppression that we're in, comes from the origins 2,000 years ago. And this still existed in the religious community. So it's not like the, this new religion has is, is, been bad. When you look at the Jewish community, the, Jewish, the, the rabbis said this, a silent wife is a gift from the Lord. Another rabbi said this, three benedictions you must say every day. Blessed is he who did not make me a Gentile. Blessed is he who did not make me an uneducated man. Blessed is he who did not make me a woman. Or, 
better yet still this, the rabbis who said, better to burn the Torah than teach it to a woman. Wow. Wow. This is the religious world 2,000 years ago. Is that this, this, you say, hey, three things you've got to be grateful for every day. Be grateful you're not a Gentile, a barbarian. Be grateful you're not uneducated, part of the lower classes. And be grateful, worst of all, that you're not a woman, because there's nothing worse than being a woman. So this is the world 2,000 years ago. This is how women were viewed. Women were seen as property. Women were seen as innately inferior to men by many Greek philosophers. There, I, could, I could be here all day talking about all the different Greek philosophers that degraded and oppressed women. And this is the setting that Jesus enters into. And Jesus turns the world on its head. See, Jesus was the first and only rabbi of his day that allowed female students, also known as female disciples. It says that, that the longest recording, recorded conversation that Jesus had in the Bible was actually with a woman. And women were the first people that were recorded to have witnessed the resurrection. So Jesus had a radically different view of women. And so when we talk about feminism, when we talk about elevating women, the word feminism is the advocacy of women's rights on the ground of the equality of the sexes. I'll say that again. Feminism is defined as the advocacy of women's rights on the ground of the equality of the sexes. So what feminism says is, hey, <laughs> women should be given the exact same rights as men because women and men are equal. And Jesus believed this. How did we know this? Because based upon his actions, based upon the way that he treated women. Right. And so Jesus was a feminist. And I would argue, in fact, that Jesus is the first feminist. Not because Jesus was the first person that cared about women, but Jesus was the first leader in history that took a stand for elevating women's rights and actually had an impact and actually got something done. And whether you want to believe this or not, many of the, many of the, uh, the beliefs and the laws and the systems we have in place today originate from the teachings of Jesus and the influence that Jesus had on society today. So the title of my lesson is this, Jesus the First Feminist. Let's go on our Bibles to Mark chapter, three, no, Mark chapter 5. Now this is not a message just for women. Now we're going to be talking about women, but we see that Jesus had a heart to save all people. And we can learn from Jesus his heart for all people based upon two interactions that he had with women. So let's go to Mark chapter 5 and verse 21. It says, When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. The one, then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, my little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so she will be healed and live. So Jesus comes from the other side of the, the, the lake of the Sea of Galilee. And uh, he comes from the Gentile side back over to the Jewish side. And on the Jewish side, it says there's a large crowd waiting there for him. Now, we think of a large crowd as like 50, 100, 200 people. In this time, a large crowd would have been defined as five to 10,000 people. So there are thousands of people waiting for Jesus to arrive. Now Jesus was, had gathered such large crowds not because he had a reputation as a great teacher. We think in our, in our Greek world, in our Greek thinking, that it's all about teaching, Jesus' teachings, that's what changed the world. What changed the world was that Jesus was known as a great healer. Because, again, we, we, we live in a society where we have readily access available to medicine to doctors, to hospitals. If you get sick, even in this country, you go to the NHS and it's for free. Yeah. And, but this is, in, this, in this world, they didn't have that. Right. There, was, there was nothing, there was no support, no structure for them. And so if you got sick, you just died. But now we hear about this guy, if you're sick, you can go to him and he will make you better. Wow. And this is what gathered thousands upon thousands of people right. to see this message of Jesus. Right. Mm -hmm. And we see all these people gathered around him, and this guy comes to him and says, Jesus, I need you to help my child. 
I need you to help my small daughter. In other, the other gospel accounts, it says, my only daughter. Mm. Now, remember, in this world, women were seen as inferior. And children were definitely not seen as a priority. Is that many excavations of Roman grave sites show that most or, or many people would have died before they reached adulthood. And so you, you, this is, and this is excavations of the, the upper classes, of the, the elite of society. And so if the elite, the, the one percent, if most of their children are dying before they reach 18, how much more so the common man? So you have this girl who's dying that most people would have seen as not being a priority. Not, most people would have seen like not worth the time, not worth the effort. But we see that Jesus is different. In verse 24, so Jesus went with him. So Jesus goes to help this man, to help this desperate man looking for healing for his daughter that's dying. And along the way, Jesus is interrupted. So we, we continue on. It says, And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak, because she thought, if I touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately her bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body she was free from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciple answered. <laughs> and yet she asked, who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. So this interruption, this distraction, this deviation from the story uh, leads me to my first point. So point number one, dignity for the disgraced. Let's look at really who this woman is. We, we, we see the story and we will break it down piece by piece. So the first thing about this woman is, she had been bleeding for 12 years. Now, right off the bat, that sounds very bad for us. Can you imagine if any one of us had, had been bleeding for the last 12 years? But we cannot even begin to grasp the magnitude of the, what this would have meant for this woman in this life, in this society. To really to wrap our head around this, we need to understand the Jewish law and what that would have meant for her. So let's go, let's stick your little bookmark in here, because we're going to be coming right back. But let's go to Leviticus chapter 15. Leviticus chapter 15. Let me know when you get there. Glory. Yeah, I'm glad Diana's chapter was good. Wow. Diana seems like she's fired up. Why don't you give her an applause for Diana for participation? Come on, guys. I'm not just preaching to Diana here. <laughs> So Leviticus 15, what is the book of Leviticus? Leviticus is the law, the law of the Jewish people. It's the regulations that God is giving his people to follow. And they're very specific. Do this, don't do this. If this happens, then this is the response. And it talks about cleanliness. So cleanliness did not have to do with morality, like right or wrong, clean, unclean. No, cleanliness had to do with the state of worship. So whether or not you were able, whether it was acceptable for you to worship God or not to worship God. And in Leviticus 15 and verse 25, it says this. When a woman has a discharge of blood for many days at a time, other than her monthly period, or has a discharge that continues beyond her period, she will be unclean as long as she has the discharge, just as in the days of her period. Any bed she lies on while the discharge continues will be unclean as it is her bed during her monthly period. And anything she sits on will be unclean, as during her period. Anyone who touches them will be unclean. They must wash their clothes and bathe with water, and they will be unclean till evening. So what the Bible teaches, what the, what the law taught, is that any woman who would have had a, a discharge of blood for longer than her, her monthly menstrual period, would have been ceremonially unclean. Now, again, this does not have to do with right or wrong morality. It's not like she's done anything sinful, but according to the law, she was not in an acceptable position to worship God. And what this meant was anyone she would touch would be unclean. 
Anything she would be un she would touch would be unclean. And anyone who touched anything she touched would be unclean. And this woman has been this way for the last 12 years. So what does that mean? No one can touch her. No one can live with her. And so this woman has this is this is the this is the world that she's been in. Now as we go back to our story in Mark chapter 5. It says that she's been this way for 12 years, and she suffered under the care of many doctors. Remember how I said that, that there, you didn't have scientific medicine. The, 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 the studies from, from Roman times showed that the physicians of their day did not even have a basic understanding of human anatomy. They don't even have a basic understanding of how the body worked, of how illnesses worked. It was just superstition. It was hocus pocus. And you see that this woman went to all of these doctors who are really not doctors, they're really con artists. These, these, these quacks are telling her what she needs to do to get better and rather than getting better, she's only getting worse. And it says that she spent all of her money, everything she had, trying to get help and no one was able to help her. Now, let's, let's make this real here. We're not talking about a woman 2,000 years ago. I gotta ask you, what are the doctors in your life, the quacks, the cons, that you are going to, that you are spending your time and your money looking for help that are only making you worse? See, this, this woman had an issue. She had a legitimate issue that, that wasn't her fault. She didn't do anything wrong. But she, had, she needed help with something, and she was looking for help, and no one was able to help her. And I think this is us today. We all have issues in our life. Some of them are our faults. Some of them aren't even our faults. They're just hardships that we have. Yeah. And we look to people. We look to things. We look to the world to help us. And it doesn't help us. It only makes us worse. Yeah. I, what, what are they? Is it social media? Facebook, YouTube, Instagram? Are you going to your job looking for that help? <laughs> looking to your education? Looking to your family? Looking to your friends? Looking to your boyfriend or girlfriend? Are you even looking to yourself? Are you a, a self-diagnosed doctor? Oh, <clears throat> I got a cough, better take that medicine. Oh, I got a headache, better drink this. Are we doing that to ourselves and are we actually making ourselves worse and worse? See, I think that this is not just one woman. I think that this woman is actually a picture of all of us. I think that all of us can relate to this woman in one way or another. Oh, bro. It says, in verse 27, when she heard about Jesus, as I said, Jesus had a reputation of a healer. That's how he gathered thousands and thousands of people. And who would she have heard about Jesus from? Someone that was healed or someone that knew someone that was healed. See, this is what's powerful. People don't care about doctrine and theology. People want to hear about miracles. They want to hear about the miracles that have happened in your life and the miracles that have happened in the lives around you. And what that does, it gives them hope. It says, oh, if that changed for you, maybe that could change for me. Come on. Yeah. And it says that she, she says, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Now, this is a bit of a, a, a weird way of thinking. Is that if I just touch his clothes, like what? Has he got some like Supreme or some, some uh, Armani or, or some, some special, special robe that, that uh, is, is going to have special healing powers in it? Actually, yes. And let me show you what this is. Because, because it's, we just see, like, you see me in a suit and things like that. But the Jews, they didn't wear suits. They had, they had special robes. They had special articles of clothing. So if we go back to Numbers, chapter, Numbers chapter 15. You guys want a history. I'm giving you history. So Numbers 15. See, the thing about the Jews, and you see this even today. The Jews were very deliberate about everything they did. Yep. Where they lived, what they ate, what they wore, everything, it had a purpose. And this comes from the law that God gave the Jews. God gave the Jews a specific law about how they were supposed to dress. And it says in verse 37 of chapter 15, let me know when you get there. It says, the Lord said to Moses, speak to the Israelites and say to them, throughout the generations, to come, you are to make tassels on the corners of your garments, with a blue cord on each tassel. 
You have these tassels to look at so you will remember all the commands of the Lord and then you will obey them and not prostitute yourselves by chasing after the lust of your own hearts and eyes. So God says, hey, look guys, you get distracted sometimes. You forget about who I am. You forget about the law that I've given you. So I'm going to give you a physical reminder that you're going to wear all day, every day. You're going to have on the corners of your, of your clothes these little tassels. And these are a physical reminder of the covenant that I have, of my law with you. And so the Jewish, what they had is they had a thing called a talit. And a talit was a square prayer shawl that you would wear over your shoulders. And on the talit, there would be these things called sitsits. And what this is, is that it's, it's a tassel that comes down, it has a blue cord attached to it. And you could look at it, you could touch it, you could grab it, and it would remind you about God. It would remind you about the law of God. And also, the, these, these sitsits, these tassels, would be found in the corners. And the corner, what it means, the Hebrew word is kanaf, which can mean corner or also wings. Wow. And so, what we see here is that he says, hey, you're going to have these things. And it's, for us, in our, in our Western society, oftentimes a lot of people would like to uncover their head when they pray. If they're wearing a hat, they'll take it off before they pray. But for the Jews, it was the opposite. So Jews would cover their head with the, before they prayed with these prayer shawls. And what it was, it would be like a, like a portable tent. It would be symbolic of the tabernacle. So they would cover it up over their head to, in reverence for God, and it would be spread out like wings. And you see, all throughout the Bible, you see this analogy of wings. David says it in uh, Psalm 61, verse 4, hide me under the shadow of your wings. Mm -hmm. um, this, there's always this picture of wings all throughout the Bible. And it actually, there's a prophecy about the Messiah and the Messiah's wings. You want to hear what it says? Yeah. Yeah. Let's go to Micah chapter 4, or Malachi chapter 4. Come on, so Malachi was the last prophet that spoke to the Israelites in, in the Old Testament. He gives them this message about the coming Messiah, and then it's silent for 400 years. And Malachi, he talks about John the Baptist. He says that it's going to be an Elijah that's going to come, and people were so excited. But before it talks about John the Baptist, in chapter 4, in verse 2, it says this. But for you who revere my name, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in its rays, and you will go out and frolic like well-fed calves. Now, the word there for rays is, guess what? It's kanaf. The, the, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in his wings, wow. in his corners. Wow. And so this is a prophecy about the Messiah that was going to be told about him, that he was going to be a healer, and there would be healing in the corners of his talent, of his, in the kanaf. And this woman, who for the last 12 years is unclean, cannot go to the synagogue, cannot go to the temple, she was seeking God so much. She was reading the law. She knew about this prophecy, and she said, this is the guy. If I just touch the corner, if I just touch the kanaf, I will be healed. Wow. And so that's what she does. Let's go back to our story. Yeah. Oh. Is that not cool? Like, how cool is that? <laughs> so it says in verse 28, because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, his kanaf, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body that she was free from her suffering. See, this woman, she wanted to come, she wanted to get healing from her illness. But that wasn't good enough for Jesus. Jesus didn't just want to heal her from this issue. He wanted to completely transform her life. It says, at once Jesus realized the power had gone out from him, and he turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? And the disciples were like, what a ridiculous question, Jesus. Like, come on. Like, who here's been on the central line in rush hour? Oh, yes. Like, you're, you're, like, you're yeah. pressed up against so the, the thing. Oh. Someone's coming up against you. And then, and then it's like, it's Tottenham Court Road, and everyone tries to get out. And oh. it's, it's crazy. Yep. Like, imagine that with 5,000 people. Oh, my goodness. And then you're, you're pressed up in the central line, and you're like, wait, who touched my clothes? <laughs> and they're like, Jesus, what are you talking about? He said, no. Somebody touched my clothes, and he's looking around. And of course he's Jesus, he knows who it is, but he's waiting for this woman to come forward. And it says that she came forward trembling with fear. Why was she trembling with fear? 
because she's pushed past all these people and made them ceremonial and unclean. Mm -hmm. she, and then she deliberately reached out and touched Jesus and made him unclean. Mm -hmm. But get this, this is what's incredible about Jesus, is that Jesus is so holy that rather than this woman's uncleanliness contaminating him, his holiness contaminated her and removed her of her illness. Wow. But Jesus, as he says to her in verse 34, he said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be free from your suffering. So what Jesus is pointing out to her is, is, is he calls her daughter. So Jesus, he was about 33, and this woman would have been quite a bit younger than him. So she's had, she's had bleeding for the last 12 years. This could have been right from, from puberty, so from the age of 12, 13, who knows. But this, this woman, she's a young woman. And she's, this is always, this has been all she's known as a young woman, is that this is who she is. And what Jesus is doing is he's giving her back her dignity. He's telling, you are a person. You matter. You are a daughter. Because this was someone's daughter at one point. But I believe that she forgot this. That she was just so overwhelmed with her illness that that came to define who she was. But Jesus says, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. Be free from your suffering is that God, Jesus was recognizing her and giving her back her life. Mm -hmm. Is that the suffering wasn't from her illness, the suffering was the consequences of that. Wow. Being cut off from the world, being cut off from the community, not having relationships, not having friendships or family. And Jesus now gives her back this back to her. <laughs> See, this is what Jesus wants for us. See, Jesus, he, he doesn't just want to, to fix like one little thing about our life. He wants to fix our whole life. He wants to completely transform us. Yeah. Fine. And so I, I want to really challenge you guys, is that as we, as we all think about it, we all can see ourselves as the woman in one way or another. Yeah. We all have these lifelong illnesses, things that we've struggled with since we were very young, like, like what Jen shared very, very powerfully and very vulnerably, talking about how even from a young kid, the, 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 the world, the people in her life, really uh, told her that she wasn't good enough, told her that her value came based on her performance. Mm -hmm. And, and this, this created this incredible insecurity. But I think it's amazing when you look at her today and see the power of Jesus in her life, yeah. to see that that's not her anymore. That's not what defines her. What defines her is Jesus. <laughs> and I think that's, that's what I want for, for all of us. That's what I want for all of us here, to be able to have that be our story. See that, that Jesus cares so much for this woman, and Jesus cares so much for you, that he wants to change your life. He wants to change everything about your life. But you need to go after him. Jesus was there. This woman went up to Jesus. She had the faith to reach out. She acted upon her faith. And this is what you need to do today. You need to act on this. So I want to challenge you, is that after the service today, is that I want you to, to, to talk to somebody, talk to the person that brought you, talk to one of your friends, talk to someone and say, I want to know more about Jesus. I want to know how Jesus can transform my life in the same way that he's transformed this woman's life. I want to have a story like hers. I want to have a powerful miracle that Jesus has worked in my life. Are you with me, guys? Yeah. 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 So this, this woman, she's a detour. She, she wasn't even planned. Jesus didn't really think about that. Remember, the main story is he's going to Jairus. The synagogue leader, he's going to help her daughter, or his daughter. And in verse uh, 35, we continue our story. It says, while Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Wow. You think about that. This guy, his daughter just died, and they say, yeah, she's dead. Stop bothering this teacher this rabbi, because Jesus as a teacher would have had a position of prominence in the society. So what they're saying is, is that she's dead, stop wasting his time. Because this is how the world saw people. This is how the world saw children, how they saw daughters. But it's amazing because it says in the English, it says overhearing them, uh, overhearing them, he's, what they said, Jesus told him, don't be afraid, just believe. The Greek could in the same way be translated as ignoring what they said. The, the Greek word it means to, to casually hear or to, to like a glancing word or, or something like that. 
So it could be translated either overhearing or ignoring. And so Jesus is like, look, don't pay attention to them. Have faith. I'm going to do this. And this is what Jesus goes. He goes to their, to their uh, house to do this incredible miracle. And leads us to our second point. Magic for the morning. Now, this isn't like some like pixie dust or like help you wake up at 6 a.m. Like, does anyone here struggle when their alarm clock goes off? Yeah. yeah. Like, uh, that, that's not what I'm talking about. I struggle with it too, but that's, just, that's for another sermon. <laughs> well, this is for the morning. That someone, someone you, you love has died and you're broken hearted. And Jesus comes into this broken situation with magic to blow everyone away. So we go in verse 37. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion what, with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, Why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. <coughs> After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately, the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. So this, this story is incredible. Jesus comes to this house where there is, there's mourning. And in, in the Jewish culture, in the Jewish tradition, you would have the women who would do this loud wailing and crying. Because women were seen as the ones to stir up the emotions, to get the emotions going. And uh, it, it, it reminds me of in Indonesia, where, uh, where I lived for a number of years. And they would have this tradition where people, when they died, they would have this loud, loud, loud wailing. It sounded like this. everybody out for making too much noise. Wow. <laughs> and this is the thing. Why did Jesus do this? Jesus isn't just so, Jesus just rock up on some random funeral, kick the door in, and be like, hey guys, stop being a bunch of crybabies. Get out of your own house. Like, that's not Jesus. No. no. Why was Jesus doing this? Because the father of the girl, the man of the house said, Jesus, I want you here. Yeah. Whatever you got to do, I need your help. And this is the interesting thing about Jesus. Jesus came to help this family to help this girl. But before he helped her, he stirred things up. The, 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 I'm, sure the, I'm sure Jairus was not expecting Jesus to kick out his whole family out of his house. <laughs> like, like Oof. sorry <laughs> sorry guys, but you're, you're gonna have to leave now. Jesus says you're making too much noise. <laughs> like, like, how crazy would that be? Yeah. But this is the thing. When Jesus comes into their life, he moves them he stirs things up unapologetically. Yeah. Jesus doesn't come in and be like, guys, I know you're feeling a lot. I know you're emotional. Like, could you, could you help me out, keep it down? Or, or maybe take outside, go for a walk or something. He says, no. Like, all right, why are you guys making all this noise? And it just says he put them out. Yeah. And destroy them. And this is the thing about Jesus is that 
He comes in and he stirs up your life. Sometimes in more ways than you planned on him doing or you want him to do. Yeah. But this is the thing, because, because Jairus was so focused on Jesus and was ready to do whatever Jesus needed him to do, he, he goes for it. Can you imagine what would have happened if Jesus comes in and says, why are you guys making all this noise? Uh, you need to go outside. And Jairus is like, I can't do that. It's my family. They're emotional right now. What would have happened? Nothing would have happened. Wow. Come on. And this is the thing, is that because Jairus was ready to do whatever it took to save his daughter, he's like, all right, Jesus, you say they got to go, they got to go. You say no one comes in except for me, my wife, and these three guys, all right, that's it. Let's go do this. Yeah. And we see that Jesus, he comes in, and we really see his, um, his, his heart to really to, to help this girl. But I think that... Um, if, we're, if we get so caught up on the, the methodology of, of how it works and the, the how and the technicalities and everything, we miss the whole heart. Is that we see that Jesus' heart, we see that he cares about this girl, that he wants to help her, but he uses kind of unorthodox methods to do it. I think uh, it, it reminds me of a, a great, great movie, The Karate Kid. Who see, who here has seen the Karate Kid? Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Old one or new one? Who's seen the new one? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I think the new one's better. It's not, it's not often that that happens where the remake is better than the original, but I think it's so much better. Jackie Chan, Jaden Smith, it's so cool. So they, they have this scene where Jaden Smith is is wanting to learn kung fu, and Jackie Chan he he gets him right. Put on your jacket, and he puts on his jacket. He says, take off your jacket. And he takes off his jacket. Throw your jacket on the floor. He throws the jacket on the floor. Pick it up. He picks it up. Hang it up. He hangs it up. And he says, do it again. 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 A thousand times he says, do it again. And the kid, he just has this little like temper tantrum. You don't know Kung Fu. You're not helping me. I just don't want to go back. I'm going to get beat up by those kids. Like, I don't care anymore. Oh. And Jackie says, shall drink. Come here. <laughs> and he, he comes up over and he says, uh, Jackie on. And he puts the jacket, he snatches the jacket out of his hand, and he throws the jacket down, he says, jacket on. And he goes like this, and he, Jackie Chan, he, he grabs his hands, and he says, strong, be strong. And then he, he, he does it, he says, jacket off, and he changes to another position. And then he, he, they, they have this really powerful scene where he says, I'll pick up the jacket, and ducks down, and Jackie Chan kicks over his head. And then he's like, okay, now, hang up the jacket, so he hangs it up, he's like, with attitude, he goes, doom, and he like, pushes his chest up. <laughs> And they, they, they have this really cool scene, it's like this fight scene back and forth, and the kid's like blown away, it's like, whoa, like I know Kung Fu. Mm -hmm. And, and the, 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 the lesson here is that Jackie Chan is the master, and he's teaching this kid Kung Fu. He's actually changing the kid's life, and the, the kid doesn't realize it. Mm -hmm. He was so focused on the method, wow. on the explanation, and he really wanted to learn the way that he wanted to learn. He, the, the kid was getting beaten up at school by a bunch of bullies, and he needed help. And the only one that was able to help him was this Kung Fu master. Yeah. But the Kung Fu master taught him in a way that he wasn't expecting and didn't want. And it wasn't until he finally was humble enough and was ready to submit to, to do what it did, even though it didn't make sense. But he really trusted, hey, this guy's got my back. This guy's going to help me. That's when he actually learns the Kung Fu. And it's really, really powerful. Wow. Come on. And I think the same thing applies for us, yeah. is that sometimes we want God to work in our life. Like, we all, we all relate to the bleeding woman. We all understand, like, hey, I got issues, I need help with my issues, uh, I've tried other issues and they don't work. Like, God would be great, but I want God to help me the way that I want God to help me. Right. I want God to do it according to my standards. Come on, and I want God to do it during my time frame, with wow. my results. Yep. And it, it just doesn't work that way. Yep. <laughs> See, the thing is, is I think we live in the most entitled generation ever. Yes. yes. Yep. We are the most grateful that people that have ever lived, ever existed. Because we feel like everything's about us. And I think we can feel like we're doing God a favor by letting him be a part of our life. Wow. Yeah? Anyone, anyone ever agree with that? Yeah. 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 And, and this, is a, this is a crazy thing, because Jesus, he goes, he does heal the girl. He does this, do this incredible miracle. And what does he say? <coughs> Don't tell anyone. Yeah. Jesus is not looking for a publicity stunt. No, no, no. 
Jesus is not looking to advertise how great he is. Like, you can imagine most, like, modern leaders, they go in and they're like, they, they, get the 10,000 people that were following me before. Quick, put this on Instagram. She was dead, but now she's alive. That's not Jesus. See, Jesus doesn't need you to look good. Like, like, it's not like, hey, God, like, my life's jacked up. If you could work in it, that would really help you out. And it would really, like, give you some more glory. No. Jesus just cared about this girl. He just loved her. He just wanted to help her. Like, this was not planned. This was, this, was a, this was a detour based upon his journey. But because Jesus valued this little girl, because he cared about her, he says, hey, she's worth it to me. I'm going to come. I'm going to help her. I'm going to heal her just because I love her. <laughs> See, this is the thing for us. Like, we're, not God, we're not doing God a favor when we let him into our life. God just loves you. He just cares about you. He just wants to help you. For no other reason, than that's just who he is. And, and this is the thing, is that we need to recognize this, and we need to be ready to do things God's way, not our way. If You see that, that Jairus was pretty desperate. Like, he, he kind of realized, like, man, there's, like, nothing I can do right here. And, and sometimes that's, the, that's the, the, the unfortunate truth, is we have to get to a stage of true desperation before we're ready to turn to God and ready to do what God says. Right. And I just, want to, I just want to plead with you guys, hey, don't wait until, until you're, you're spiritually dying. Don't wait until your whole world is falling apart before you're ready to turn to God. Just turn today. Just, just do yourself a favor. Just let God into your life now to do this incredible, incredible work. Come on. My challenge for you guys is this. Be ready to change any and every part of your life if you want to see God work a miracle. Because that's the only way it works. Jesus does not want a part of your heart. Jesus wants all of your heart. It, and he, he's not in the negotiating business. Either it's all or nothing. And if you give him all, look at what he does. For no other reason than that's just who he is. That's his character. That Jesus is not like the world. Jesus is not in this for any other reason other than he just loves you. And he just cares about you. Yeah. And so this is what we see. We see that... That Jesus went against culture. He went against society. He did not accept the status quo. He did, not, he did not agree with everyone else because it was popular. He says, no, this is who I am. This is my character. I care about all people. Old people, young people, rich people, poor people, educated people, uneducated, white, black, men, and women. Yeah. And I think that when we look at these, these two women, we really see Jesus' heart. A heart of compassion is that, hey, this is who he is. Jesus is a healer. He healed people all throughout his lifetime, and he's still healing people today, and he wants to heal your life. But you need to seek after him. You need to go act in faith and reach out for him in order to be healed. Jesus wants to come and to do a miracle in your life. He wants to show you magic, to do what you think is not even possible. Mm. And you all, he's, he, he's here. He wants to do it in your life, but you need to let him. Yep. And you need to let him without permission. <laughs> whatever, the an, whatever the question is, whatever the problem is, the answer is Jesus. Yep. Whether it's something that you've struggled with your whole life, like the woman who had been bleeding, or whether it's something that you just see as impossible, there's no way out of the situation, like a father who had lost his daughter. Mm -hmm. Jesus is the answer. And Jesus wants to do the same thing in your life today that he did in their lives 2,000 years ago. Yes. Yeah. This is who Jesus is. Yep. Jesus loves everyone. <laughs> he loves women. He loves men. And he loves you. Yeah, yeah. I want to challenge you guys to seek after Jesus, to find out who he is and what he can do for your life, and that he can change your life the same way that he's changed their lives. I love you guys, and that's our moment for today. Oh, yeah.